Cripple Tom. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. And one of the deplorably miserable East London homes in a dark, wretched room at the top of a house lay a crippled boy, greatly neglected and comparatively unknown. When quite young, his parents had died, leaving him to the mercy of an aged relative whom he called Granny. Born a cripple, he had always been a sufferer, but as long as he was able, he had swept the cro a crossing on the crutches or gone on short errands to earn a few pence. But soon after his parents' death, the boy had to take to his bed. Very ungraciously, the old woman allowed him to occupy the top room in her house, which room he never left again. His mother taught him to read and write, and sometimes on a snowy night, the lad had crept into the mission hall merely for the sake of getting warm, numb with cold and weary in body. He took a little heed to what he had heard on those nights, but laying alone day after day, there came into his mind the memory of it, and by degrees he was possessed with a great longing to know more about the things of God and to have a Bible of his own. He knew that it was from the Bible that the speakers had gathered their knowledge, and that was all. So summing up courage, he one day consulted Granny about it. His only encouragement in that direction was an ironical laugh. Bibles weren't, weren't in her line. What did a lad like him want with a Bible? So the matter dropped for a time, but the lad's desire to possess one did not grow less. One day, however, up, up the creaking stairs came noisy, boisterous Jack Lee, the only friend the cripple had in the world. Hurrah, hurrah, got a new box off north tomorrow come to say goodbye tom he said he cried all excitement seating himself on the bed and wiping the precipitation from his bow but i've got a real beauty present for you my lad taking from his pocket something that was wrapped in a greasy bit of brown paper tom raised himself on the elbows but not at all gladdened by the news he had heard a bright new shining a shilling for you tom and you're not to spend it till you're once suffering real particular. Oh, Jack, you are good, but I want something very, very particular. You're due. What it, what's he? I want a Bible. A Bible? Well, I never, whoever heard of a poor lad spending all that on a Bible. When I had to scrape months and months to, to save it in the coppers. Don't be angry, dear Jack, cried the crippled boy. You're going away. And I shall be a lonelier than ever. And oh, I do want a Bible. Please get it, Jack. Now, this very evening at Fisher's before the shop closes. Granny never never would. She spent it on gin. If I get it, let her get it into her hands. What can you want with a Bible, Tom? Only scholars understand them, their things. He answered rather crossly. Maybe so, Jack, but I am hark hankering after one. For I must find out whether there, there are them folks in the mission hall you and I sometimes used to go told true about some, someone they call Jesus Christ. Let it be your parting gift, Jack, and you will make me glad. Very well, lad, then I'll go. But I know it's not of Bible buying. Fisher has, has him at a shilling, for I saw him marked in the window when I used to go by. Quick, Jack, or the shop will be closed. Jack complied everything ungraciously and descended the stairs less rapidly than he had mounted them. But he had over his disappointment before he returned with a beautiful shilling Bible. Fisher says, I could leave you a better friend, Tom. And he declares the shilling couldn't be a vested better. And he said, it may be worth a thousand pounds to the lad, so appears there's something in we ought to know about. Tom's joy and gratitude were, were unbounded. I know it. I know it, hugging the book into his breast. I'm happy now. Oh, how kind you were to save that shilling. Month after month of hard reading, crippled Tom knew more about the Bible than maybe many who have possessed to study it for 20 years. He learned the way of salvation, his only teacher being the Holy Spirit. He learned how that obedience to God's will meant helping to save others. It won't be. It won't do to keep this blessed news to myself," he said. So he thought and thought until 
At last, a simple but very beautiful work was decided for, for, on for the master. His bed stood close by the window sill, which was low, and somehow he got a pencil and paper and wrote out different texts and dropping them into the noisy street below, directed to the passerby, please read. He hoped that by this means someone might hear of Jesus Christ and his salvation. This service of love faithfully rendered went on for some weeks. Then, when one evening he heard a strange footstep, and immediately afterward a tall, well-dressed gentleman entered the room and took his seat by the lad's bedside. So you are the lad who drops texts from the window, are you? He asked kindly. Yes, said Tom, brightening up. Have you heard as someone got hold of one of these? Plenty, lad, plenty. Would you believe it if I told you that I picked up one last evening and God blessed it to my soul? I can believe in God's word doing doing anything, sir, said the lad humbly. And I am come, said the gentleman, to thank you personally. Not me, sir. I only does the writing. He does the blessing. And you are happy in this work for the Lord Jesus Christ, said the visitor. I wouldn't be happier, sir. I don't think nothing of the pain in my back, for shan't I be glad when I seize him? To tell him that as soon as I'd known about him, I did all that I could to serve him. I suppose you gets lots of chances, don't you, sir? Ah, uh, lad, I've neglected them, but God is helping me. I mean, to be again afresh. At home in the country, I have a sick boy dying. I had to come to town on, on a pressing business trip. When I kissed him goodbye, he said, Father, I wish I had done some work for the Lord Jesus. I cannot bear to meet him empty-handed. And the words stuck to me all day and the next day until the evening when I was passing down the street and your little paper fell into my hat. I opened and read, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, John 9, 4. It seemed like a command. I had professed to be a Christian for 22 years, my lad, and when I, was in, made, when I made inquiries and found out who dropped these texts in the street and why it was done, it to my shame and humbled me that I determined to go home and work for the same master that you are serving so faithfully. Tears of joy were rolling down the lad's face. It's too much, sir, he said. Altogether, too much. Tell me how you managed to get the paper to start with, my lad. That weren't, that weren't hard, sir. I just had to talk to Granny and offer to give up my hot port old milk she it, it gives me most days. If she won't, would buy paper instead, you know, sir, I can't, sli I can't slice long. The parish doctor says a few months or cold weather may finish me off, and a drop of milk ain't much to give up for my blessed Jesus. Are people happy as has lots to give him, sir? The visitor sighed a deep sigh. Ah, lad, you are a great deal happier in this wretched room make, making sacrifices for Jesus than thousands who profess to belong to him and have time, talents, and money, and do nothing, little or nothing for them. They don't know him, sir. Knowing is loving, and loving is doing. It, it, it ain't love without. You are right, Tom, but now about yourself, I must begin to by making your life brighter. How would you like to end your days in one of these homes for crippled lads where you would be nursed and cared for and where you would see the trees and flowers and hear the birds sing? I could get you into one not far from my home if you like, Tom. The weary lad looked wistfully into the man's kindly case and after a few mo moments silence answered, Thank thee, sir. I have heard, heard tell of, the, of them before, but I ain't anxious to die easy. When he died hard, I might get taken up with things a bit too much, and I'd rather be looking for him and carrying on this work until he comes fetch me. Plenty of joy for a boy like me to have a mansion with him up there throughout all eternity. The visitor felt more reproved than ever. Very well, my lad, I will see that you have proper food and all the paper you need while you live. I will settle it all with one of the Bible women. Now, there, before I go, I want you to pray aloud for me. And as he made the request, the straw man knelt down by the crippled boy's bedside, scarcely suppressing a sob as he covered his face with his hands. The lad trembled at having to do so, such a thing. 
But when he saw that the bowed form and heard that half stifled sob, he knew he ought to comply with the request. There was a seraphic light on the poor, pale, un upturned face as he said in a tone of the deepest reverence, Lord Jesus, I know you're listening and I'm much obliged to you for sending this friend here to cheer me up in my work for you. Now, Lord Jesus, he's a bit troubled about have, not having worked for the enough in the past days. Will you help him to see to it that there's nothing left undone in the coming days? And please, Lord, make him go straight away and tell them other rich men that they don't know thee if they are, aren't working for thee. And I'm grateful to you, Jesus, for all the paper and food that's a coming to me while I live. Maybe I'll hold out a bit longer to write these texts for thee. Now, Lord Jesus, please bless this uh, kind friend on the roads and always. I ask this for thy name's sake. Amen, said the deep tone voice. Then the gentleman arose and said farewell before leaving London. He made a every arrangement for the lad to be cared for. And then with a gladder heart, he went back to his beautiful country home and lived for Christ as soon as he could. He built a mission hall on his own grounds and preached salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ to the villagers when he confessed his sins of negligence to, to, toward them and told them of his met rededication through the crippled boy and his text. Many of them were led to the Lord Jesus Christ who came to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. News of the dying lad reached them from time to time through the Bible woman, but it was not till winter sent in and the snow had fallen and covered the earth with its crystal whiteness that they had heard that the dear lad had gone to be with Jesus. The same post brought a partial which contained Tom's much prized and much used Bible. What a precious relic was that marked Bible in that beautiful home. But when the crippled boy's friends lent it to his youngest son to read, that careful marking, the short, simple prayers written by the crippled lad on the margin and then on his dying wish on the leaflet, written about a week before his death, that this holy book may be a great friend to someone else as it had been to me. Make such Made such a deep impression on the youth that he gave himself to the Lord and later on to the mission work in the foreign fields and out in Central Africa. He had shown that worn Bible to many a native Christian. When they when telling about Cripple Tom and his text. This beautiful incident of consecration and lowly life teaches us that the most adverse circumstances coupled with intense suffering need not interfere with a life of most intense devotion to Jesus Christ. Thousands of sad, weary hearts are wanting the ministry of love that we might render. Shall we then take our ease, enjoy our pleasure, or indulge in other luxuries? Millions of dark, benighted souls are crying out for the light. They continue to grope in the darkness while many of us who profess to love Christ live self-centered and self-indulgent lives. Today, without the help of the world, the Christian church could easily send enough missionaries out to evangelize the world, but the dark blot of it, of it won't. Stains its, its bare name. Oh, that the Spirit of God would, by His mighty power, cleanse away all the slothfulness, unreality, and uncomplacency from our lives. For following Christ means self-sacrifice, and there is no such thing as holiness without it. If a dying lad in a suffering destitution could joyfully deny himself the little sip of milk which cooled his parched lips and partly fed his weary body, surely it is possible for us to do more. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? First Chronicles 29, 5.